Welcome everyone to tonight's presentation. I'm Preceptor Amat, and I'd like to introduce to you Marie Vance. I'm sure most of you know her. Uh, you may not know uh, a lot about her um, actual work life. She's a senior research scientist at HP Labs. And um, Marie uh, works in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Her main interests are predictive and analytics, statistical language processing, and other approaches to document and data understanding. She is doing research in social virtual reality as a platform for immersive educational experiences. Marie holds a PhD in computer science from Colorado State University, and she's recently completed a second master's degree in library and information science at San Jose State University. Marie's going to speak to us about uh, the International Society for Image Imaging Science and Technologies Archiving 19 Conference. Uh, this is an international uh, community of technical experts, managers, practitioners, and academics from cultural heritage institutions, universities, and commercial enterprises that explore and discuss the digitization, preservation, and access of 2D, 3D, and AV materials. Uh, this year's conference was held in uh, May in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, Marie is going to um, summarize some of the um, most uh, uh, interesting presentations that she heard from uh, CERN, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and others. But she's also going to summarize a presentation she delivered based on our efforts to preserve ACARA materials called Preserving Virtual World Cultural Heritage Using Preservica and Custom Metadata Schema. So I'll turn this over to Marie right now. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, again, my name is Marie Vans, and what I'm going to be doing is giving you a recap of the recent archiving conference that I attended in Lisbon in May. Um, and as uh, Pat said, I'm a senior research scientist um, in Fort Collins, Colorado. And um, at HP, I work on functional text analytics and predictive diagnostics. I co I've completed my master's in 2016, and I've actually been heavily involved in Vicara since 2014, either as a student, intern, or, or alumni volunteer. So my, my main interests are have evolved from using 3D virtual worlds to exploration of social virtual reality platforms for librarianship and education. So tonight, I'm going to be focusing on one of my favorite conferences, uh, ISNT's Ar Archiving Conference. And ISNT is the Society for Imaging Science and Technology. ISNT build themselves as the first place technical professionals and users go for knowledge on techniques, processes, and systems for imaging. Well, it seems strange that a society focused on imaging would have a conference about archiving, but in fact, a huge part of imaging is preservation as well as digitization. So I will cover what the conference is, who are the professionals that attend, and give you some highlights from the year's conference. Then I will go into a little more depth on one of the papers I presented as it is of interest to our community here. I will end with some fun facts about the venue in, Le in Lisbon and some references. And I hope you guys got a chance to read the uh, comics. So it's not too boring. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start out with describing what the conference is. As I mentioned previously, ISNT sponsors the archiving conference. This conference brings together technical experts, managers, practitioners, as well as academics who come from all over the world and they represent cultural heritage in institutions, universities, and companies like mine at HP in order to explore and discuss digitization, preservation, and access of 2D, 3D, and AV materials. So the one thing I love about this conference is the venues this conference has had. And I've been going to this conference for the past five years. The first was at the Getty Museum in LA in 2015. And I don't know how many of you have ever been there, but that's really an amazing place. 
Then in 2016, I went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and in 17, to Riga, Latvia, of all places. And if you ever get a chance to look, look that up, that is a, a pretty amazing building. I was back at the National Archives, and then this year, we went to the National Archives of Portugal in Lisbon. So the archives are one of the oldest institutions in Portugal. And, and believe it or not, it was originally established around the year 1378 in one of the towers of, a cast, of the castle during Ferdinand I's reign. And the purpose of the institution was to serve as a reference for the king and nobility. But apparently they kept documents related to the administration of the Portuguese empire as well as diplomatic relationships. Obviously, the current building isn't part of the castle, and here in the middle is in the in the middle of this image is a, like a, an opening, and that's where we would go into the archives for for the conference. Um, it was built. This this particular building was built in 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 inhabited in 1990, so it's it's quite a bit newer than 1378. So now we're going to talk briefly about what go who goes to these conferences. So I put together this slide to show the institutions the presenter that the presenters keynotes and regular papers and posters where they come from. So some of them I'm sure you've rec you'll recognize the Library of Congress, National Archives, and the Smithsonian. And because the conference was held outside of the US this year, there were many folks coming from museums, universities, national archives, and libraries from across Europe. Maybe one of the most recognizable is CERN, where the Super Collider resides. Another is the National Gallery in Oslo, where Edvard Muntz, the Scream painting, is usually displayed. It's currently temporarily closed while the gallery moves to a new location. But in this talk, I'll be, co be covering um, rep presentations from the institutions, most of the institutions represented here on this slide. So now I will highlight some of the most interesting talks I saw this year in Lisbon. And we're going to start with the keynotes. Jonas Palm is the Director of, the, of Preservation Strategies at the National Archives of Sweden. His talk was titled, How the Market Changed and the Lives of Photographs. Now he gave us a ton of statistics on the number of digital photos being generated every day, month, and year. And if you didn't know it, in 2017 alone, 1,200 billion were generated. During his talk, he started a counter on a couple of social media websites to show us how many photos were uploaded during the hour that he spoke. And it, by the end of the talk, that was almost 4 million in one hour. Now, think about that and, and the fact that 90% of all recorded information has been generated in the last two years alone. So how are we going to preserve all this data, let alone manage it? He started out by describing the progression of recorded information from clay tablets to parchment to papyrus to high quality paper and finally to digital. Then he focused on images starting with photography. He spoke to the fact that as technology has has made creating images easier and easier, we have become less discerning about those images we create and keep. And I really liked the analogy he came up with for of, of our having gone from carefully curating physical photograph, fat, photographs to vacuuming up images as a way to deal with too much information. So clearly, we, we will need algorithms such as AI and machine learning approaches to help us manage because right now, most of us have so many images, we can't possibly even know what we have. Now, I know I'm, gonna, I'm going to botch this name. 
it's a French name, but another keynote was by Jean Vise Lemure, <laughs> who is a project manager for the Digital Memory Project at CERN. As many of you probably know, know, CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It's located in Geneva. And it is the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. And as such, it generates the highest rate of data collected in the world. And I'll show you, well, that we're showing you, I'm showing you that now on this slide. Um, the vast majority of that data is generated by the Large Hadron Collider. And if you can imagine it, a data point is created at every collision point of the of a particles traveling at the speed of light in an environment that's minus 270 degrees or very close to absolute zero. And the data collected amounts to 1 billion data points every second. And at the same time, they're collecting 40 million images of those collisions every second. So how do they deal with this astronomical, no pun intended, amount of data? First of all, they don't keep all 40 million images. Inst instead, they keep around 1,000 of those images. Um, but per second, that's still a lot of data when you consider that it's every second. And in addition to this data, they also have physical data in the form of photographs, audiovisual ma materials, and sound recordings that date back to 1954 when CERN was established. So. Jean explained to us that they are using a preservation platform which is currently under construction, so they're not finished with it yet. But it conforms to the OAIS model and is based on open source digital repository software called Invenio and preservation software called Archivematica. Archivematica. Okay, so now moving on to the regular program, one of the most interesting presentations was by Richard Solomon of the University of Pennsylvania in collaboration with NASA. And his talk was titled, Towards a Digital Noah's Archive, DNA. The problem they are working on is one I actually didn't even know existed. In space, data needs to be protected from ionizing radiation. On satellites, spacecraft, and even in the International Station, data needs to be continually refreshed because of the damage. So Richard Solomon and his team is working on a solution to this problem called WARF, which is a silver-based write-once, read-forever medium. Now WARF is distinguished by a stable, dense, data media requiring minimum maintenance and no continuous energy input for centuries long and potentially millennium storage. The idea is to save our most important data outside of the planet. Whoops, not sure what happened there. Let me find this place again, sorry. Okay, there, back here, there we are. Okay, um, so now um, the idea is to save the most important, uh-oh, hey guy, is somebody um, touching the, the, the um, presentation? Shouldn't be jumping around like that, sorry. Okay. Um, so we're, okay, so the idea is to save it, save the most important data in case we blow ourselves up. And, you know, when the aliens come, they can find, figure out who, who we were. So WARF is now being tested on the international, is, is currently being tested on the International Space Station. And um, there will be uh, results in the, in the near future on, on, the, um, on how, um, how well it works. Okay, so the next presentation was interesting from an object preservation perspective. Kathy Martin of Drexel University gave her talk called Object VR Fashion, the Drexel Digital Museum Project on the use of VR technology for, for preservation of fashion objects. Now, they basically use 3D modeling 
create a virtual experience of fragile fashion objects in a way that minimizes the handling of those objects. The first picture in here, the first picture here is, uh, is an example dress from 1948. An elaborate studio is set up to take pictures of the dress from every angle. And these images are put together to create a 3D rendering of the dress, which can then be seen through a VR experience as shown in the bottom image. And if any of you guys have been in Sansar, you notice that this bottom image looks a lot like Sansar. But I think it's, it's actually viewed. The next one was given by Brian Pope of the ARC slash K project in LA. This paper, archiving, di uh, Digital Archiving Technologies, Practices and Ethical Guidelines in Crowdsourced and Community-Based Efforts in Culturally Endangered Society, also uses 3D technology. He showed us a series of images taken by people on the ground in Venezuela of cultural heritage objects in danger of being destroyed. So for example, many of the statues there are made of materials like bronze or silver, and these can be melted down for other purposes. The project demonstrated that by crowdsourcing images of these culturally significant artifacts, they can at least be documented to, to a point where they may be reconstructed from 3D images. So even if they're melted down, they can be recreated. He showed us several examples, including this one that's shown in the image on the slide. So the next one is both amazing and sad. This one really touched my heart, I have to say. Alex Lacole from the UNESCO Memory of the World Project presented on her topic, Digitizing and Preserving the Tool Slang Genocide Museum Archives. What made this work interesting, aside from the topic, it's, is that it's centered on challenges they faced trying to preserve rapidly deteriorating objects um, from this particularly gruesome time in history. These challenges include lack of resources, the age and condition of the materials, the need to create a database to hold the digitized versions of the artifacts where technology is almost non-existent, and the fact that they needed novel scanning solutions in order to handle the materials as little as possible. And finally, the need to train locals to help with the work, such as image processing and editing. So they had a very difficult time finding people to help because people there do not want to dig up the past. And this project focused on the disappearance of more than 18,000 Cambodians who went through the tool slang prison which was actually a school prior to the reign of terror. Here you can see the outside of the museum and inside a row of images of some of the disappeared. This is a great example of how UNESCO is trying to save history in very challenging environments. So Colin Wells of the United Nations office at Geneva gave a presentation titled Total Digital Access to the League of Nations Archives, Digitation, Digitization and Analog Concerns. So how many of you know what the League of Nations is? Just type a yes in the chat if you know what the Nations is. So some know and some don't know. That's really, that's, that's me too, actually. <laughs> it is the precursor of the United Nation. It was actually set up in 1919 after World War I and existed until 1946. And why do you think it was disbanded? Right, because <laughs> its mission of preventing another world war um, actually failed because as we know, we had World War II. So it, the League of Nations is generated, at, it's, at the time it generated a lot of paperwork and it's now deteriorating very quickly. And the main reason for that is because the boxes and the paper that, that 
that is stored in them contain an acid that's causing them to yellow and fall apart. Many of you may know about this problem with very old documents. Colin and his group are desperately trying to digitize the artifacts before it's too late. And once that's done, we will all get to see the information because they plan to make it freely available on their website for research purposes. Okay, so here's another very interesting project that I thought was pretty amazing. Bendik Bry Bry Brydy from the company called Pickle, that's how you pronounce Pickle, is working on a project for preserving data, not in space like PenU and NASA, but up in the Arctic, like the seed, like the seed vault. Now he and his company have developed a way to preserve data in a digital format that does not depend on any operating system or other software. The medium is tape, which is one of the most robust media out there still for preserving data. And the data is preserved on the tape together with instructions on how to read it. Pickle is currently working with the Norwegian National Museum. This is the, the one that's associated with the gallery that holds the scream. Um, to, to document all their content to be stored in a vault in the Arctic. Okay, so the final presentation I'm going to talk about before we go on to our presentation is the second paper I gave at the conference on the work I'm doing with my colleague Steve Simsky at HP, or he's, he's at CSU, um, but I worked with him before he left at HP. So this is also part of a book I'm writing with Steve due out next year on, the, on functional text analytics. Our paper focused on showing different ways that text analytics can be used to improve search, language translation, optimization, and learning. Some of the ways we provide these functionalities include summarization, clustering, classification, and cate categorization. The picture on the side is a copy of the poster we also presented during the poster session. Okay, so now I'll go through the talk of the work that Pat and I did earlier this year on preserving Vakara's cultural heritage. Okay, so that's a picture of me giving the talk um, taken by one of the program chairs, but I kind of look like a goofball thinking about making a run for it. I don't know how they got that picture. <laughs> I think it's very funny. Um, the project itself started because we realized that there are many challenges to preserving Vakara's cultural heritage. Due to a lack of resources, we can't just buy some Amazon AWS space or Google Drive space beyond the 15 gigabytes that we have for free to store all our stuff. Since Vakara is a student-based group, the turnover is high, and in fact, every year, in fact, every year, um, we lose people who have created artifacts and we gain people who are unfamiliar with our culture. So every semester we have events and an annual conference as well as bi as bi biweekly meetings and tours. This actually generates a lot of data. Aside from virtual world ob objects like those we are surrounded by here, we have out world objects like text chat and word documents, machinima and document templates. So we decided to create a blueprint or prototype of a process that would help with these challenges by using a combination of an established archiving system together with a customized series of metadata schema that reflect our specific needs. We also wanted those artifacts to be easily browsed by new students learning about us. We use Preservica, a preservation archiving system designed to work with many of the standard preservation workflows. And here are the categories we came up with, with for our metadata schema. You will notice that we have in-world objects and supporting documents. So for example, we have for in-world, we have media on a prim and JPEGs for supporting documents. We use these categories to develop an inventory also separating, separated by in-world versus supporting. 
And here is, I don't expect you guys to be able to read this, but this is an example of our inventory. Um, I just wanted to point out that we have two pages in, the, in an Excel spreadsheet, one for in-world objects and one for supporting objects. But each column in this worksheet eventually became part of a metadata schema template. So we also have copies of images for every in-world object stored in a team drive, and we have a link in the inventory to that image. And here are two examples of metadata, uh, metadata schema templates that we use. We fill them in. They're in XML, and you'll notice that in each line in the template corresponds to a column in the, in the inventory spreadsheet. So here I'm just showing an in-world object template and a supporting document template. And um, basically, these will become, we use these for every object. So once we have these templates, we use them for creating a separate file for each object. Then, using Preservica, we automatically upload the metadata files along with that artifact. And this slide shows an example of an image we used for announcing of a car conference keynote speaker. You will notice that there is basic metadata that Preservica fills in automatically about the file itself and the Dublin core schema, which contains our custom metadata. Now here's a screenshot of the WordPress based front end for Vacara's digital repository. This is the starting point for universal access to the repository as we have defined it. You'll notice um, that you can get to everywhere else in, 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 um, in the repository through this main page. And this slide is a snapshot of several images from a virtual world course taught on the SJSU iSchool Second Life Island a few years ago. They are all uploaded to Preservica and can be seen with the metadata once an image is clicked on. Hold on a second, I gotta go back. Oh, shoot. I should, I don't know how to fix it so that people don't accidentally touch it and restart it by mistake. Okay, uh, go back, go back, go back, go back. Uh. Sorry about this, guys. At least we have time. All right. So, um, yeah, so then we're going to go over here. So now we're going to go over some fun facts. And I apologize if you already know these, but I, it, it actually, stuff, stuff I didn't know and I was fascinated by it. So I had the opportunity to go into many of the main squares and parks of Lisbon, and I used the metro to go downtown for the conference dinner, and I ran into hundreds of young people dressed like this. What's that remind you of? Yes, indeed. I thought it must be some kind of a weird mega Harry Potter fan club, to be honest, but there were thousands of them. So <laughs> I asked around and I guess what I discovered. Turns out that J.K. Rowling taught English in Portugal as a way to fund the writing of her first Harry Potter book. So the uniforms that all the students at Hogwarts wore are based on Portugal's university uniform. So now we all know where those distinctive costumes came from. Okay, the other thing I noticed was the roosters. They were absolutely everywhere. So what's up with that? So these are called Barcelo's rooster, and it's considered the unofficial symbol of Portugal. They came about from a legend in which a pilgrim who was sentenced to hang for a crime he didn't commit told the judge that a cooked rooster would crow at the hour of his hanging to prove he was innocent. 
And sure enough, at that hour, the cooked rooster stood up on his plate and crowed. Apparently, the judge freaked out, <laughs> as would I, and start, ran to stop the hanging. Okay, so boy, this is not an hour, but this is good because it gives us plenty of time to discuss. But um, this concludes my talk, and I do have a bibliography for every paper I reference. So if you 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 can either get those off of here because I'll leave this up for a while, or you can let me know if you want a copy of one of the papers, and I'd be happy to send it to you. But I'll but I'll never admit that I that I did. So I have like three pages of references here for all the papers. And thank you. Thank you, Marie. That was really interesting.